Welcome to Mech's Online Campus. Okay, quiz time. We're gonna find out your IQ. <laughs> we'll let you find out your IQ. This test has eight questions, and let me tell you our grading scale. I got this straight from Cracker Barrel. If you get four more right, you're a genius. If you only get three right, you're pretty darn smart. If you only get two right, you're just plain dumb. And if you only get one right, you're an igno moose. Okay, got it? Here are the questions. Now, I just want you to kind of think in your head if you know the answer. Here we go. How long did the Hundred Years' War last? <laughs> which country makes Panama hats? From which animal do we get cat gut? In which month do Russians celebrate the October Revolution? What is a camel hair brush made of? The Canary Islands in the Pacific are named after what animal? What was King George VI's first name? And where are Chinese gooseberries from? Okay, got your answers? <laughs> Let me go ahead and tell you that if you answered the obvious, you were wrong. It was a total setup. Here we go. The Hundred Years' War lasted 116 years. Panama hats are made in Ecuador. Cat gut comes from sheep and horses. The October Revolution is actually celebrated in November. A camel hair brush is made of squirrel fur. The Canary Islands are named after a dog. And the first name of King George was Albert. And Chinese gooseberries come from New Zealand. Okay. Any geniuses? I doubt it. Bunch of ignoramuses, but I'm not going to make you wear a shirt. Okay, let's see if we can make a quiz easier. Let's do a news quiz, and let's see how well you kept up with the week's current events. These are from the New York Times news quiz. I'll only test you on five of the questions, and these were from last week, a week ago. So you've had time to really kind of catch up on your news. So let me give you just five, see how you do. Here's the first. An appeals court this week blocked a Texas law that would allow state and local police officers to do what? Arrest federal officials for taking down border fences. Arrest migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border illegally. Close legal ports of entry into the state from Mexico. Operate on Native American reservations. Refuse to cooperate with immigration officers. Got your answer? Well, the answer was arrest migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border illegally. Okay, second question. What is the United States calling for in a draft resolution to the UN Security Council after vetoing three previous resolutions on the subject? A deployment of police officers to Haiti, an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, an immediate ceasefire in Sudan, an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine, or recognition of India and Israel as nuclear weapon states? The answer, an immediate ceasefire from Gaza. Okay, some of you are thinking, well, that was easy. I got those right. Okay, let me take you down a notch or at least make you challenged a bit. Ireland's Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, announced that he would be stepping down. What is the position of Prime Minister called in Ireland? Is it Doyle Aaron, Shanad Aaron, uh, Taktadala, uh, Tisha, or Tan Eshta? Got your answer? Or I should say, have you got your guess? <laughs> Here's the answer. Tisha. Okay, now that I busted everybody's bracket, let's keep going. The EPA issued new tailpipe, uh, tailpipe pollution limits meant to ensure that most new cars sold in the U.S. by 2032 are what? Able to run on ethanol, all electric or hybrid, built using union labor, powered by hydrogen, or topped with solar panels? Okay, the answer all electric or hybrids. Okay, one more. Unilever, the personal goods giant, announced this week that it would spin off which division of the company? Beauty, which includes Vaseline. Home care, which includes Surf. Ice cream, which includes Ben and Jerry's. Nutrition, which includes Hellman's. 
or personal care, which includes acts? And the answer is <laughs> ice cream, which includes Ben and Jerry's. Okay, let me just give you one more bonus question from last week. This is old news by now, so you're gonna get this one. Which college basketball team was given a number one seed in the West, as God intended, and then went on to win their first two games, also as God intended, to make it to the Sweet 16? Well, I'll give you a hint. If God is not a Tar Heel fan, why is the sky Carolina blue? See, this is just theology. Now, why did you probably do a lot better on that quiz than the first one? Well, it's because news is, well, news. I mean, it stands out. You pay attention to it. It gets promoted. It gets broadcast. There's an old saying in journalism that dog bites man is not news, but man bites dog is, meaning that it's the unusual. It's the unexpected that makes news. You never hear about a story of a plane that didn't crash. We're here because of a new story. What we're talking about right now is because of a new story. One that was so big, so epic, so history-making, we're still talking about it. Jewish man in the first century dies is not news. What made it news? He didn't stay dead. Here's how the event was recorded by the historian Luke, preserved for us in the Bible, when a four independent biographical accounts of the life of Jesus, and all four tell the same story. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day? Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. Interesting last line, wasn't it? They didn't believe it, but in truth, almost nobody believed it. It was just too much. It was, it was too incredible. And it's one of the things that I love about the Bible is that it's so authentic and so real, and it records that kind of reaction to the resurrection of Jesus unflinchingly. Well, here's another example of initial disbelief to what it is that we're celebrating and marking this very day. After Jesus had died and the rumors of his resurrection were circulating around, two of his followers were heading home. We only know the names of one of them, Cleopas, but the other person with him was probably his wife. They had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. They were excited about Jesus being there and what he might do only to then see him arrested and tried and, and, and executed. And now they were heading home, uh, confused, to say the least. Here's what happened along the way. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them, but God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. Well, the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Okay, just pause it there. 
and think about what we just read. Here were two followers of Jesus, but then came his crucifixion. And even though they had heard the news about his resurrection, they didn't believe it. Everything about Jesus for them became past tense. I mean, did you catch their language? They, you know, he was a prophet. He did powerful miracles. He was a mighty teacher. We had hoped he was the Messiah. They didn't get it. Even though Jesus had told them that this was how it was going to play out, they couldn't get past what had happened on Friday. They couldn't get past seeing a dead corpse impaled on a tree. Even though Jesus had told them, I'm going to be killed. That's part of how this is going to play out. For example, let me give you some examples of what he had told his followers long before that last fateful week ever took place. These are all recorded in the historical biographies of his life and his teaching in the Bible. For example, he said early on, the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things. He will be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. And then again, after that, taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus said, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem, where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans. He will be mocked, treated shamefully, spit upon. They will flog him with a whip and kill him. But on the third day, he will rise again. I mean, that's clear, isn't it? But look at what was added by the biographer Luke, writing after the fact but they didn't understand any of this. The significance of his words was hidden from them and they failed to grasp what he was talking about. And here's why. They had no place in their thinking for three of the most radical ideas the world has ever had to contemplate. The real problem of the world, the real nature of a Messiah, and the real ending on Friday. Let's talk about all three. First, let's talk about the real problem of the world. The real problem of the world is not political oppression. It's not war, it's not injustice, it's not poverty or hurricanes or earthquakes. As important as those things are, as much as they matter to our daily lives, they are nothing compared to the biggest problem we face, the real nature of the world's great crisis, which is our need to be spiritually rescued from all the things that we've done that separate us from God, that we were created to be in a relationship with God and we've rejected him, which has eternal implications. No matter what fills our life in the short span we're on this planet, it's nothing compared to eternity. The second big idea has to do with the real nature of a Messiah. If we're in trouble spiritually, they had no concept of the kind of rescue, the kind of saving that if it were to come from God, was going to have to be. See, since they didn't think that their primary, primary problem was spiritual, but was more sociopolitical, uh, they were looking for a political or military conqueror. At the time, the Jewish people were under Roman occupation. They were looking for someone who would liberate them from that, conquer the Romans and liberate them. But the idea that the problem wasn't Rome, but their spiritual separation from God, that unless that was addressed and saved in that way, that they would be the ones rightly nailed to a cross for their sins. The fact that they didn't get it made it so that they didn't see how a suffering Messiah, not a conquering one, would be of any value at all. So how did Jesus respond? Well, let me read it. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. <laughs> you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What a tour that would have been. What, what, what did those scriptures say? What was it about the Messiah that had always been made clear that they had just missed? They had made everything about Jesus dying on a cross so confusing. What was it they were missing? While we don't know for sure which ones he walked them through, it's a safe bet uh, that they included this one 
from the prophet Isaiah to give you a taste of it. It's an interesting read. Let me read it. Now remember, this was written hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. This was a prophecy. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. You know, I often describe what we just read, what Jesus did to, peop um, to people this way. Imagine you're brought to trial for vehicular homicide. You were driving on the road, exceeding the speed limit, and then you were trying to read a text, and you lost control of the car, didn't see where you're going, and you hit a child on our way home from school. Killed her. You're brought to trial, the evidence is presented, and from the bench, the judge states, I find you guilty and must sentence you to death. But then he does a strange thing. With compassion in his eyes, he gets up from behind his bench, he takes off his robe, and he walks down to where you stand, and he embraces you. And he says, but I love you. The penalty must be carried out because I'm an honest and good judge, and what you did was wrong. It must be paid for. That's the law. But I love you, and I don't want to see your life end this way. So I will go in your place. And then he walks out of the courtroom and goes straight to death row. That's what Jesus walked them through the scriptures to see. That all along, the Messiah had one goal, to take our place, to pay the price for our sins, to die for us. Well, here's what happened next. By this time, as they were walking along the road, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. And that's when it all fell into place. These three radical ideas finally came together. The real problem of the world, the real nature of the Messiah, and then the third one, the real ending of Friday, which wasn't on a Friday. The real ending of Friday was on Sunday. See, they really did have a conqueror. They had a conquering Messiah, only what he conquered was sin and death. But don't make this all about just life after death. This is about life before death that we can experience as well. Forgiveness of sins can happen now and you can live in that restored relationship with God now. And the power that raised Jesus from the dead can raise your life now. I don't know what kind of Friday 
you're living with, what kind of Friday you can't seem to get past, what you can't see beyond, what has stripped you of hope. I could probably try and guess. For some of you, it's the weight of your sins. You don't think that there's any way God can look at you with anything but revulsion and rejection. The guilt and the shame that you are carrying is just overwhelming. That's your Friday. For some of you, it's how you've been burned by the church, burned by Christians. You've seen judgmentalism and hypocrisy and toxic cultures, and it's just about wrecked you and it certainly turned you off to spiritual things. That's all you can see. That's all you can feel. That's your Friday. For some of you, it's the hole in your heart that has come from utter tragedy. You lost your husband to cancer, your child to a car wreck. Death has marked your life. And at times it's made it so that you can hardly breathe. I don't know exactly what your Friday might be, but I do know that you have one. But I do know something else. Friends, Sunday came. Sunday came. I can come to you. I have a friend named Tony who tells about speaking on Easter in his home church in West Philadelphia, Mount Carmel Baptist Church, which is a predominantly African-American church. Now, before I tell you about what happened with Tony, um, you know, at Mac, we're a diverse church, you know, young and old, male and female, white, black, brown, which is good. But it used to be said, though, I remember in seminary, that I went to that if you couldn't preach in one of the historic all-black churches up north, uh, that you couldn't preach. <laughs> when I first heard that as a young guy in my 20s, I didn't know what they meant. Um, I just kind of chalked it up, but okay, I need to remember that. I know what they meant now. And I've loved every chance I've ever had to experience it. One of the highlights for me, just chase a rabbit here, um, uh, was speaking at the Grand Old 12th Street Baptist Church in the Roxbury District of downtown Boston. 12th Baptist Church is a direct descendant of the first African Baptist meeting house on Beacon Hill, which was founded in 1805. In 1840, a group of dissenters from that church felt led by God to become involved in the Underground Railroad, an organized means of smuggling slaves from bondage in the South to freedom in the North, and they became known as the 12th Baptist Church of Boston. For more than 50 years, that church was pastored by one of the finest men I've ever known, my friend Michael Haynes. When I first met Michael, I asked him what he he did, and he said he was you know pastor of a church, and I remember him saying, "Just a little church in Roxbury, as you know, that's that's just you know my ministry area, just three or four city blocks." And one of the first persons on those blocks that he had a chance to serve was a young man named Martin given his first ministry opportunity in a local church by Michael. Let me show you a picture of Michael and Martin. Yes, it was that Martin. <laughs> Here's a picture a little bit later of me and Michael around the time I spoke at his church. We were at a banquet together. Uh, you can see he aged well and I have not. <laughs> you know, I remember the first time I ever spoke at a church like Michael's. Right after I got out of seminary, I was invited uh, by a friend of mine to speak at his church. It was the Mission of Faith Baptist Church on Chicago's South Side. And when I got there, my friend Gene took me back into his office and he said, Jim, have you ever spoken in a black church before? And I said, well, uh, no. <laughs> Is there something I should know? And I was remembering what I was told in seminary. If you can't preach in a, one of the historic black churches, you know, you can't preach. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's all happening now. And he just kind of laughed at me. He said, you'll find out. <laughs> so I went out and I started into my talk. And in about two seconds, I found out what was different between Gene's church and every other church that I'd ever spoken at to that point. And why it was said that if you couldn't preach there, you couldn't preach. They help you. <laughs> they just talk you right through that thing. If I said something good, they'd say, yes, Lord. That's right. That's right. And I wasn't used to people talking back to me when I, <laughs> one of the old deacons would just say, preach, brother, preach, you know, and amens would start flying all over the place. And sometimes, sometimes even got one of the ladies to say, well, well, <laughs> and folks, when, when the women in their church raise their hands and say, well, I mean, it's like your, your hormones start to bubble, uh, but it works both ways. If you're not so hot, they let you know that too. 
You can be preaching and have someone stand up at the back row and say, help him, Jesus, help him, Jesus. <laughs> That's not so good. And another thing, they're used to the messages lasting an hour, um, hour and a half, easy. I remember I finished my 30 minute talk and I turned around to sit down and Gene just looked up at me and he said, get on back up there, you're not done. <laughs> but I was done, I was finished. And so I, but I got back up there and that's when uh, the help him Jesus comments started. Well, back to Tony. In his case, there were seven men, seven men lined up to speak that day. He was sixth and the senior pastor was seventh. And he said that after he was done, and he gave his talk. He said, you know what? He said, I don't think I ever gave a better sermon. In fact, he said he was so good, he wanted to take notes on himself. And the more he preached, the more the folks got turned on, which got him turned on. And then, yeah, he finished and he sat down and the senior pastor leaned over to him with a smile, kind of reached down, patted his knee and he said, you did all right. <laughs> and Tony said, all right, are you telling me you're gonna be able to top that? wrong move. <laughs> the old man looked over at Tony and said, son, you just sit back. The old man is going to show you how it's done. And he did with one line. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. He started off slow saying, you know, it was Friday. It was Friday and my Jesus was dead on the tree, but that was Friday. Sunday's coming. And he heard a preach brother preach, you know, and that was just all he needed. He said it was Friday. Mary's crying her eyes out. The disciples are running in every direction like sheep without a shepherd. But that was Friday. Sunday's coming. And the amens were flying and people were saying, come on, come on. And he got a couple of wells. <laughs> he picked up the volume a little bit and he said it was Friday. The cynics were looking at the world and saying, you can't change anything in this world. You can't change anything. But they didn't know it was only Friday. Sunday's coming. He said, it's Friday. And on Friday, Pilate thought he'd washed his hands of all that trouble. And the Pharisees were strutting around, laughing and poking each other in the ribs. They didn't know it was only Friday. Sunday's coming. And he looked over at a woman. He said, Mary, Mary, he said, we buried your honey last week. We went to the cemetery. We dug a hole. We put him in the ground. But Mary, that was Friday. Sunday's coming. And he just worked that phrase over and over for a half hour, then an hour, then an hour and a half. Over and over he came at him. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And at the end, by the time he got there, the people were just exhausted. And then he just yelled at the top of his lungs, Friday. And then the whole church shouted back at him, Sunday's coming. And it did. And it's real news, which is why we're still talking about it. Father, thank you for that incredible, life-changing truth. Today, we remember it and we celebrate it. In Jesus' name.